uh, you have a, an icon um, labeled chat. If you think of any questions um, as you're listening to the presentations, uh, please go to that chat channel and um, indicate uh, maybe who you're asking the question uh, to. Um, and uh, we will have, after each presentation, we will have five minutes for uh, short questions to clarify um, things that have been uh, explained in the, um, in the presentation. And at the end, we will have um, a Q&A session for more general questions. So I'd like to start by uh, introducing the first speaker, Osma Suominen of uh, National Library of Finland. Uh, he helped build the Finnish ontology um, service and um, is, uh, has been leading the development of um, the Scosmos vocabulary browser and uh, ANIF, which he will now present. Osma? Thank you, Tom. Um, I will try to share my presentation. So yes, I will be giving an introduction to ANIF and automated subject indexing, but first I will present myself briefly. So my name is Osmo Suominen and I'm working as an information system specialist at the National Library of Finland. Uh, before I joined the National Library, I uh, completed my doctoral thesis on semantic portals, which involved uh, applying semantic web technologies to, to various uh, web-based applications where um, uh, controlled vocabularies were uh, in an important role. And, uh, and I joined uh, the National Library seven years ago, and my um, first uh, assignment was to, to um, together with, the, with others, to, to set up the Finto uh, thesaurus and ontology service that we use for uh, uh, publishing controlled vocabularies, such as thesauri ontologies and classifications. Um, and I've also been working on opening uh, up uh, our bibliographic metadata as linked data. And then of course, um, today's topic, automated subject indexing. And um, while working on these projects, we have uh, uh, produced uh, several open source tools that we've shared for others to use, um, including uh, Scosify, which is a validation tool for SCOS vocabularies and Scosmos, which is the, um, the technical platform for Finto, and then uh, ANIF, the automated subject indexing tool. So, and this is, this is the Finto service. Um, it's, um, it's a place where we publish uh, vocabularies and our most important uh, subject vocabulary is the general Finnish ontology YSO. It's uh, trilingual in Finnish, Swedish, and English and has uh, more than 30,000 concepts. And we use it uh, in, in many Finnish libraries and other institutions as well. Okay, uh, but then let's talk about uh, subject indexing. Um, this is also known as topic indexing, topic assignment or term assignment, but depending on the context. And um, it's similar to the practice of tagging, which is used on many web platforms and uh, in the machine learning context, uh, multi-label classification is very close to subject indexing as well. And, um, <clears throat> um, the, the, the problem that is, this tries to solve is that um, in many in, in libraries, uh, we generally have a very large collections of different kinds of documents and, uh, and um, to make them findable, we uh, attach uh, subjects or, uh, to them so that they can be searched using those subjects. And, uh, but this is a lot of uh, work. It's, it's manual work usually. And um, it would help to have uh, a tool that could uh, assist us doing this. And uh, for example, suggest uh, appropriate subjects for a document. And uh, this is not a new idea. Uh, this uh, has been, uh, systems like this have been uh, developed at least starting from the 1960s, for example, with the medical subject headings uh, used in, for medical literature. And, uh, and there are many, many tools and products that can do this. Uh, but from our perspective as a, a national library of a small country, um, uh, they, they suffer from a, a, a few problems. Uh, first of all, they usually don't support the national languages we use, Finnish and Swedish. Um, 
And then the other problem is that they don't support the vocabularies we use. Uh, so for example, many of these tools are tied to a single uh, uh, vocabulary. Even if it's an important one like mesh, it's, it's not the one we are using. And the third problem is that they tend to be proprietary products that cost a lot of money. And then uh, if you buy it, you get a black box, you can't uh, affect uh, how it works, and then you're stuck with the vendor. So uh, this is not a very uh, uh, attractive, uh, it's not a very attractive idea to buy, buy a product like this. So um, instead, um, we started thinking about whether it would be possible to, to leverage our existing metadata and um, to, to build a tool that could sort of uh, um, detect patterns in the, in the data we have um, and, and uh, 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 then um, help us produce more metadata. And um, the most important uh, source for metadata um, we have in Finland is, is the Finna uh, Discovery Service. It's like a search engine for uh, uh, museum, li library and archive collections. And um, um, currently it has about 15 million uh, objects and uh, not all of them have a subject metadata, but many do. So, so you can get like maybe 10 million, uh, uh, some kind of documents or objects with subject metadata. And we use this uh, you know, to, to train uh, uh, machine learning models uh, that can then assist us uh, in producing more metadata. And um, so let's, talk briefly about those algorithms. There are two main approaches um, that are useful here. Uh, the first one is a lexical approach. And this is also the more traditional one that has, has been used for many decades. And the basic idea here is that we have a controlled vocabulary with terms, uh, and then uh, we try to match those terms uh, into uh, terms or words that occur in documents. So if we have a sentence like this, that renewable resources are a part of Earth's natural environment. And, and then we have a, 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 subject, uh, a subject heading or a, a term in a vocabulary called renewable natural resources. Uh, uh, an algorithm could match uh, this to the, to the sentence and notice that there is a potential ma match here. And then when it goes through the entire document, it will produce uh, a lot of these uh, candidate matches and then the challenge is to filter those and find the ones that are really uh, really describe uh, the important topics of the document but anyway this is the lexical approach and one benefit of this approach is that you, you usually don't need a lot of training data to to um, to build an algorithm like this uh, because it's mostly relies only on the vocabulary and uh, and not, not on uh, examples of how it has been used. The other approach is an associative approach and this is uh, more in line with uh, machine learning uh, but, but in general any kind of statistical uh, methods are involved here. So here the idea is to learn uh, correlations between uh, concepts that are used for used as subjects and, and, uh, uh, and terms or words that are, occur in documents and um, so for example, this same concept, renewable natural resources, uh, the algorithm could uh, identify based on uh, many examples of documents uh, with this subject that this is correlated with the words that you can see in this word cloud, like uh, uh, renewable or energy or resources or environment or technology. Uh, and this, but this kind of approach requires a lot more training data uh, to get good coverage of each subject. So you need, often you need hundreds of thousands or maybe millions of, of examples to train one. Okay, and here are some of the algorithms used in, in, in ANIF. Uh, there's uh, one lexical algorithm, uh, it's called MAUI and it's a well-established tool uh, developed some years ago at the University of Waikato. Um, and um, it's, it's a good baseline for lexical, uh, uh, for the lexical approach. And then we have several associative algorithms. Uh, the, the TFID of similarity um, is, is very simple. It's a baseline method, uh, but it's a good starting point. And then there are others like fast text and Omikuchi, which are uh, uh, more advanced and uh, uh, also heavier to train. And uh, these are implemented in ANIF as 
they are called backends. Uh, so ONIF is, is more of a framework uh, where uh, different algorithms can be plugged in. And uh, in ANIF, these algorithms can be used either uh, alone, just a single algorithm at a time, or in a combination, uh, which is called an ensemble. So to make an anal analogy with musicians, uh, of course, the, the algorithm can be either a solo player or a, a, a more like a, a quartet like here, or quintet. And, um, and usually, or all, almost always an, an ensemble is better than its parts. So when you combine algorithms, they usually cover for each other's deficiencies and the combination is stronger than any of the individual ones. Um, here is a picture of the technical architecture of ANIF. ANIF is the bo big box in the middle. So it's, um, it's, it's a Python uh, application built on the Flask and uh, connection toolkits. And um, it has uh, some modules to deal with the configuration and uh, vocabularies and so on. And then, uh, then there are these backends. There are regular backends that are just a, a single algorithm. And then there are these fusion or ensemble backends that combine uh, uh, input from, from several of these regular backends. And uh, it has a, an API that can be used to integrate it with other systems. Okay, and um, so uh, ANIF is, uh, is a tool. Um, it's, um, it's not specific to a single vocabulary or, or a specific language, it's multilingual. And um, if you want to use it, you, you need to access it through one of the, one of the available uh, channels, there is a command line interface, which is used for the most uh, administrative tasks. So for example, to, to set, up, uh, 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 set up projects and then train, train those uh, projects or models, and, and then for testing and evaluation on large collections of documents. Uh, then there is also a small web user interface for interactive testing and um, as I mentioned before, a REST API for integrating with other systems. Because ANIF is really meant to be a, 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 like a microservice that is used by other, other systems and not so much a tool of its own right, but, but something that you uh, connect with, with other systems. Uh, here is an example of, of how the API works. Uh, the core method of the API is called suggest. And the idea is that you give it a, a text here is just an example sentence. And then uh, the API responds with uh, uh, suggestions of concepts that uh, could be relevant for this input text. So in this case, for example, red fox and dog. Uh, are, uh, and then uh, each suggestion comes with a URI uh, identifying the concept and, and the label of the concept, and then a score that is um, an estimate of how good the suggestion is, how well it describes the input. Uh, it's an open source tool and it's being developed on GitHub and um, on, so all the code is there and, and there are issues and pull requests and so on, which are sort of the uh, the day to day development is happening there. And uh, it's, um, it's a Python code base requires Python 3.6 and uh, uses the Apache license, uh, which means that it can be used for pretty much everything and it has um, uh, a good coverage of unit tests and so on. And there's also a lot of uh, technical and usage documentation in the, in the GitHub wiki. It is also available um, to other channels. It's, uh, it's a package that is published on the PyPI, which is the Python package index. Um, and also we provide uh, Docker, uh, pre-built Docker images uh, through the Quay, uh, Quay.io service which make it, makes it easy to, to uh, try out on if, uh, in a, in a pre-built container. And um, of course, the, the reason I'm giving this talk today is that um, I would like others to, to also apply on if uh, for their own uh, data and their own uh, uh, problems. And, um, and the, the basic process is very simple. So you have to, choose a, a, an appropriate subject vocabulary. Uh, for example, um, any SCOS vocabulary should work. 
and then uh, prepare a corpus from existing data that you have, for example, in um, metadata repositories. Then uh, load the vocabulary and train a model. I will show this briefly shortly, and then, then it can be used to suggest the subjects for new documents. So uh, now um, I will do a, a brief demonstration of ANIF and um, just to show how, how to work with it. And in this demonstration, I will first uh, load uh, a particular vocabulary. In this case, I will use the SDW, the source for economics, which is a bilingual German English uh, vocabulary, a bit less than 10,000 uh, concepts, and then uh, train a small model uh, using uh, metadata from the EconVis portal, which is a um, collection of economics literature. And, and, and then finally, I will, will show how to test the model. So here um, you should see um, a window uh, and uh, the, the, there are, within this, this is a virtual machine and I'm, I'm showing, uh, showing the configuration for, for this uh, UNIF installation. And here I have already configured a, a small uh, a project for, uh, for this purpose. Uh, and just set some settings. And now I will need to uh, load the vocabulary, the SDW thesaurus from a SCOS file into this project. It takes about maybe 20, 30 seconds or so. I guess this is the classic demo effect takes longer than you expect. Okay, so now I've loaded uh, the vocabulary and uh, now um, I will train the model from a, a sample of data from the EconVis uh, portal. This is uh, about 100, it is 100,000 documents. So I'm, I'm training the model and this is a very basic TF-IDF model. So this is the simplest possible model uh, that you can use in UNIF. It should take about 30 seconds to train this. Still training. <laughs> and and uh, so these, um, the documents I'm training on are just uh, uh, titles, uh, document titles uh, from the EconVis portal. So. Uh, there's not that much information per document. Okay, almost done. Now it's done. Okay, so um, now I can start up the web interface. And I will open a browser window. Okay, so this is the UNIF uh, web interface. And uh, I will first test with something, just uh, let's say economics literature, enter some text here. And it will su suggest uh, subjects like economic theory, economics, bibliometrics. Okay, so that seemed, seemed to work. Uh, then I will go to the BBC news uh, site and uh, it seems that the big news item for today is, is about this uh, banking scam involving the HSBC bank. So I will using, use this article as an example uh, on copying the text from the first part of this article and then pasting it here. So this is the, the um, let's um, clear the share buttons. Okay, do some cleanup here. So this is the article from the first part of the BBC news item. And now uh, the suggestions for this small project that we just trained was banking history, bank, banking law, bank regulation, and so on. These are, it's, it's basically recognizing that this is about banks, but uh, it's not a very uh, specific result. 
But then I have here also another project that I trained uh, before this presentation, and this is an Omikuchi model, uh, a much stronger uh, machine learning model, and I trained it on a million documents from EconBiz instead of 100,000. And it should produce better results than this. Uh, but it took about 40 minutes to train, so uh, that's why I couldn't, uh, couldn't do it live here. And uh, this algorithm suggests for the same text, United States bank lending, banking supervision, money laundering, United Kingdom. So this is already a much better result than the previous one. It knows, for example, that this is about supervision and money laundering and economic crime comes up as well. So here you can see that uh, training, training a model from existing metadata, you can get suggestions like this. Okay, let's put that in the background. And uh, if you want to try this out yourself, uh, there is a, a, a very similar form uh, on the ANIF website at anif.org, where you can find some pre-trained models, uh, uh, especially uh, using the Finnish journal ontology. Uh, so you can test this, this on, on your own documents as well using that demo. So um, now, I'm finished with the first part of what I'm speaking and I'm, um, I can take a few questions. Um, I haven't watched the chat window, so I don't know if there's anything that's come up, but um, after those questions, then there will be other presenters in, in the middle. Uh, Koral Kagolub will talk about evaluation and Annemiek Romain and Sarah Beltran will talk about the case study and then I will uh, uh, continue with uh, some other uh, aspects of ANIF, how it's used and, and how we've evaluated it. Okay, stop my sharing now. So any questions at this point? I haven't seen anything in the chat window, so. I just asked um, one question for clarification. Um, the um, TFIDF created a vectorizer. Uh, is it easy to describe in plain English what a vectorizer is? <laughs> yes, um, well, I'll try. Um, uh, in in uh, uh, machine learning applications involving the natural language processing, the input is, is of course usually some kind of text and uh, uh, but to 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 be to make a machine learning model on text, uh, it usually uh, you need to turn that text into some kind of numbers. And a vectorizer is basically a method for turning text into numbers. And the basic idea is that you just uh, uh, give every word that you encounter a number. So a number one could be car, and number two could be dog, and then you just convert the, those uh, uh, words. Uh, the incoming words into numbers because the numbers are then easier to process using an algorithm. Okay, I don't see any other questions right now. So at your discretion, I think maybe, maybe we could move on to the next talk and then uh, we'll have more time at the end for uh, question, questions and answers. Yes. So I want to introduce the next uh, speaker, uh, Cora um, Golub uh, of Linnaeus University, who um, is going to talk about evaluating automated um, subject indexing. Okay, thank you, Tom. Uh, do you see the screen? Do you see the shared screen? Yes. Yeah, okay, thank you. Okay, well, thank you, Asma, for this wonderful presentation. We are often faced in automatic subject indexing with evaluation. It's quite complex. And then some state that it's possible to entirely replace manual indexing. Other results range from 50 or 60% accuracy, 90% accuracy, depending on context. However, how do we really know how good automated solutions are when we have so much context related to that? 
So I'll talk briefly about evaluation problematics. In 2003, Lancaster, in his known textbook, wrote that research comparing automatic versus manual indexing is seriously flawed because laboratory conditions are the ones that are applied out of context. And there are very few reports of indexing tools, automatic algorithms in actual operating information systems. And these challenges of evaluation are uh, quite uh, much related to two concepts, the concept of relevance and the concept of indexing. So I'll talk a little bit about each of them first. The challenge of relevance. Why do we want to talk about that when we talk about subject indexing? Well, the ultimate purpose of subject indexing is often making relevant documents retrievable. But relevance, how do we measure this? Relevance is a complex phenomenon. There are many possible relationships between the search query that the user writes and the documents that are retrieved. This is because relevance is subjective. It's also known to be multidimensional and dynamic with a lot of research giving, explaining this and giving examples. Let's just give one example. The relevance criteria may be very different even within psychology when they work on the same problem, let's say schizophrenia, if they come from different approaches to address it. So behaviorism, cognitivism, neuroscience, and psychoanalysis, a document may be about schizophrenia, but may be irrelevant based on which paradigm one is coming from. In practice, evaluation of information retrieval systems is based on pre-existing relevance assessments. This is known as the Cranfield model, where we have a gold standard. The gold standard comprises a test collection, which is a set of documents, a set of topics to which these documents belong, and a set of relevance assessments that say whether one document is about one topic or not. And then um, this has been heavily criticized, but it's still the common model. And in 2008, Saracevich wrote that in spite of the dynamic and multidimensional nature of relevance, in practice, we still do only comparison against the gold standard. And he refers then to an early study on retrieval conducted in 1956, which powerfully influenced this. Here, Gal, um, the owner of this study, reported that two groups of judges could not agree on relevance judgments. And since then, it has become common practice to not use more than a single judge or a single object for establishing gold standard, which of course doesn't really work in context or in real life. This was a little bit about the first challenge when we do evaluation. The second challenge is related to subject indexing as such. If we look at the uh, current ISO standard, which promotes on how to conduct subject indexing, it is really a document-oriented definition. We have three steps. We first determine the subject content of a document. We then conduct conceptual analysis to decide which aspects should we represent. And then we translate those concepts into a controlled vocabulary at hand. However, some collections are also um, indexed using request-oriented or user-oriented indexing, where the indexer's task is a bit broader, not just referring to a document, but trying to actually anticipate what topics or uses this document could be relevant. Another related problem with this is the fact that aboutness, like relevance, is also very context-dependent. It depends on factors like interest, task, purpose, knowledge, even norms, opinions, and attitudes, like we also saw on the example of schizophrenia. Then each collection has its own indexing policy, meaning how many documents, how many topics should be assigned per document, and how deeply um, they should go when we describe topics. So if we look at school libraries, they will be very superficial and broad. But if we look at academic libraries or indexing and abstracting services for journal articles, they will be very exhaustive and deep. Which means that a subject correctly assigned in a high exhaustivity system may be wrong in a low exhaustivity system. And something else. 
we have um, inter-index consistency, so consistency between two indexers, but also within one indexer who may assign different terms at another point in time. And this um, is really uh, much related to higher exhaustivity and specificity and bigger vocabularies. Consistency will be higher if we have a vocabulary of 100 terms, and it will be much lower if we have a vocabulary of 14,000 terms. Also, indexing can be consistently wrong, as well as consistently good. So high indexing consistency is not always a sign of good indexing quality. What does this all mean? It means that terms assigned automatically, but not manually, might be wrong, but they may be just missed by manual indexing on purpose because of an indexing policy or um, by accident. And this is why it is not good to use existing classes as the gold standard only. Because of these challenges, as part of a project, a number of colleagues where I was involved proposed a framework for evaluation. This framework wants to provide a comprehensive overview and therefore triangulates methods and explores multiple perspectives and contexts. It, depending on the resources available, advocates to have to apply three complementary approaches. The first approach is to evaluate indexing quality directly through assessment by an evaluator or by comparison with the gold standard, which we talked about just recently. However, in this case, the gold standard is carefully crafted that we'll talk about in a moment. The second complementary approach is then to evaluate indexing quality directly in the context of an indexing workflow. So while um, catalogers assign index terms. And third one, because the purpose of indexing is improved retrieval, we want to see the effects it has on retrieval performance. In more detail, the first approach, evaluating directly through an evaluator gold standard, here we can have two main approaches. One is to ask evaluators to assess index terms assigned or to compare to a gold standard that we mentioned before is the most common approach already. But what are our recommendations here in more detail? Let's say that we have a collection that has a number of different subjects. Within that collection, we can select three distinct subject areas that are well covered by the document collection. And for each subject area, we can select 20 documents at random. Then we use a team of at least six people, two professional subject indexers, two subject experts who are also end users, and two end users who are not subject experts, and have each of them assign index terms. Then we use our algorithm or cellular algorithms like uh, ensembles in ANIF or individual approaches that ANIF, for example, provides. And we assign all the um, automatically provided suggestions. After that, we prepare one long integrated listing of all index terms assigned by any method. So by all algorithms, by the team of six people who assign them separately from each other, independently from each other. And then we have a long list of all the potential terms we could think of in this larger context. And then we have two senior professional subject indexers who are probably more experienced and preferably two end users, go through each of the index terms and then remove terms assigned completely wrong and also add terms missed by all the previous processes. As such, we will have a gold standard that is informed by uh, much more evidence than just um, catalog records that uh, we discussed before have uh, some issues. Um, having said all that, the exact number of indexers, number of documents must be considered in the context and also take into consideration, of course, available resources. There are no studies known um, that I'm aware of how these numbers affect results. But intuitively, we can claim that less than 20 documents per subject area would make the results susceptible to random variation. And why do we choose different subject areas? Because it is known that uh, certain 
topics are easier to automatically derive. For example, physics papers produce much better accuracy than do humanities papers because humanities is on purpose often metaphorical and requires the reader to, to read between the lines and so forth. Anyway, this was the first step. The second step would be to evaluate machine-aided indexing tools like ANIF in an indexing workflow. We are aware of medical text indexer that has been well researched and used in the US National Library of Medicine, for example. The purpose of this evaluation is to assess the value of providing human indexers with automatic index term suggestions. And here we recommend four phases. First is to select baseline data on, based on unassisted manual indexing as one usually goes about it. Then is um, a familiarization tutorial with the tool for the indexers to understand how it works. The main step is then an extended in-use study where we do four things. We observe practicing subject indexers, again in different subject areas because these practices will vary. Then the indexers assess the quality of the automatic term suggestions. We also identify any usability issues. And finally, we evaluate the impact of term suggestions on terms selected. So how many of the suggested terms were actually selected and also why? The fourth phase is to also conduct a semi-structured interview that would provide further context on these choices and observations from phase three. So such evaluation basically considers the quality of the tool suggestions, the usability of the tool, but also it's good to take into consideration the indexer's understanding of their task, experience with machine-aided indexing, the resulting quality of the indexing, time saved as some of the facets that um, we try to take into consideration here. And the third and final step is to evaluate indirectly through retrieval performance because the major purpose of subject indexing is successful information retrieval. So what we do here, we compare retrieval results from the same collection using indexing from different sources, meaning manual source, um, meaning uh, different algorithms that we were testing or the different ensemble or combinations of algorithms. And here the emphasis is on detailed analysis of how indexing contributes to retrieval successes and failures. So a recommendation could be to have a test collection of some 10,000 documents, ideally an operational collection with available control terms covering three or more subject areas so that we can compare again across subject areas. Then we index um, selected or ideally all of these documents with all of the indexing methods to be tested. So say different algorithms or different implementations of the same algorithm. And then for each of the subject areas, we choose a number of users who are ideally equal number of end users, subject experts as end users, as well as information professionals. Then what happens is that users conduct searches on several topics. And here we could have different topics, free or controlled. One topic could be an extensive search, which is likely to benefit from the index terms. One topic could be a factual search, which is less dependent on index terms, as we know from previous research. Then users assess the relevance of each document found using a grayscale rather than binary, say from zero to four, from not relevant to highly relevant. And we also need to instruct users on uh, how to assess relevance in order to increase iterator consistency. And then we finally compute retrieval performance metrics. And we could also conduct complementary research like log analysis, observation, questionnaires, and interviews. And we end with performing a detailed analysis of a trio retrieval failures and successes, trying to judge why certain methods worked better than others. In conclusion, we saw that some claims um, that their automatic tools are highly successful, which is especially the case for a smaller number of topics and for commercial solutions. 
but we are faced with big evaluation challenges and therefore we have proposed a framework comprising three aspects, direct evaluation, direct evaluation in the indexing workflow and indirect evaluation through retrieval, which also needs to be informed by empirical evidence. And some references will be provided in the end. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thank you very much, Cora. Are there any questions? Okay. Um, okay, so if there are no questions, um, then I propose we move on um, to... There was a question. Ah, yes. You suggest creating a proper gold standard using subject areas that have good coverage. However, it is also very interesting uh, to evaluate performance on subject areas with fewer data. Is that possible too? Yes, of course it is, um, especially if yeah, we want to examine the effect of fewer training data on performance. What then will be the challenge is to invest more resources in creating a proper gold standard because um, we will have um, fewer metadata already assigned um, and so forth. But the only reason really for suggesting that is to be able to have more uh, sturdy and trustworthy results uh, based on more statistics. But certainly there are other cases when we want to test how good the algorithm performs with your data that are interesting in this context. Okay, thank you very much. So I'd like to introduce now the uh, next uh, two speakers, um, Anamika Romain, uh, of uh, KNAW Huygens Institute for Dutch History and Sara Veltun of the National Library of Netherlands. Thank you. Um, we are going to talk about a, a case study we did with ANIF and it's a historical legislation that we looked at. Uh, we will be uh, uh, just briefly about us. Um, I'm uh, Annemieke, I'm a researcher, and I did a researcher in residence project at the Dutch National Library, which uh, basically entails that I will, wanted to work with their collection and they uh, provide help with doing that um, with a, uh, a research software engineer, and that was Sarah in this case, who helps out on the technical part of such a digital humanities project. And uh, uh, Sarah knows much more about the technical side and I will be explaining a little bit more about the, the historical context in which my uh, research question uh, took uh, place. So we briefly will talk about the hypothesis that I uh, formulated, then we talk about our sources in numbers, uh, how did we uh, prepare our sources or our data, and then um, what kind of categories were we dealing with? And then how uh, Sarah will be talking about how she trained ANIF. Um, what I want to know is how early modern legislation from one country to another influenced each other. So how did the, um, did the text influence, uh, for instance, from Holland, the text from Flanders or from Utrecht? And that uh, requires knowing what they all uh, refer to. So metadata and uh, topic modeling um, could be interesting ways of uh, solving that and seeing um, whether texts um, are similar from one place to another without having to read them all full text. So early modern legislation was uh, promulgated and uh, stuck to uh, walls of uh, known places such as markets or um, this Powell house you see here in Amsterdam so that people could actually read them. These uh, texts have uh, consequently been uh, collected in 
uh, books of ordinances. And these are a huge stack of books and um, we have used them for the provincial legislation. And well, these collections basically have all the text um, um, consequently put uh, after one another. So there is not one text per page, but sometimes you have six texts per page and sometimes you have one text for several pages. So that required some um, segmentation, uh, but we'll talk about that in a, in a little. We uncovered about 108 books um, for uh, the Low Countries, and uh, from that there were 88 uh, in Roman font and 20 in Gothic, and we had to deal with several languages, but about 75,000 pages um, we uh, needed to deal with, or at least that was the hope we had. Uh, obviously, a project of six months uh, is a bit ambitious to cover all those grounds. But uh, what we did was um, we uh, taught the computer how to read and how to segment the text. And contrary to the Google Books project, uh, the text weren't really readable when uh, you're dealing with Gothic text. So we needed to train a model and we did so with Transcribus. Transcribus is known as a handwriting text recognition tool, but print text can just be uh, seen as a very uh, regular handwriting. So we trained uh, models to read these texts and we also uh, trained some um, segmentation, which uh, in the end uh, we did on a rule-based um, um, tool just to, to speed things up uh, within this project. But we segmented the text so that we knew where the, the, the title of the text was and where the end of the text was, so that uh, uh, Sarah could uh, enjoy uh, a little bit of fun with Anif uh, in, in these texts. Um, so we had well readable text thanks to uh, Transcribus, and now we wanted to figure out whether the computer was able to um, categorize these texts. So I had manually labeled about 3,000 texts. Uh, in this case study, we used uh, 470 of those uh, pre-labeled um, um, laws, and uh, we applied a, a hierarchical categorization. So it was already a, a existing um, classification that we used uh, from the Max Planck Institute for Ur uh, European Legislation. And uh, they have a four layered uh, um, categorization. And we added a, a fifth layer because we needed to determine whether something was an ordinance or not. Uh, there were some international treaties uh, in these books as well. And we converted this uh, hierarchical categorization into a SCOS, um, so a short knowledge uh, organization system. And um, in the next uh, image, you will be seeing, you see how this categorization basically looks like. The first uh, question was, is it an ordinance or not? And then you had a division into uh, the top uh, categories. And this was then split out into uh, more specific categories. And in total, we had about 1800 categories that could be uh, chosen from. And uh, with that, uh, I had already pre-labeled these uh, legal texts, and now we wanted to know whether the computer could uh, basically take over and um, uh, automatically categorize according to this uh, um, pre uh, um, this set of uh, potential categories. Yes, so that's where I'll take over, as I did the, the AMI programming. Um, at the KB, the National Library of the Netherlands, we have been experimenting a bit with AMI already uh, for our uh, thesaurus of subject terms, the Brinkman thesaurus. Um, and what I really liked about Anamika's project is that this categorization is very strictly hierarchical. And I was interested in how AMI would deal with such a categorization system. Um, so as Annemieke already explained, we had 40, 470 labeled documents, where each document is single law, and those were pretty short text, so were, uh, mostly one or two paragraphs or something like that. Um, and she manually assigned uh, subjects to them, 
uh, at, ma at maximum uh, 10 subjects, on average, they were 3.3. And those annotations were as specific as possible. So 70% uh, of them were at the, the, the deepest level and 28 on the uh, uh, next deepest level. Um, and we set up ANIF to train per category level. So uh, at level five to have the, those really detailed terms, but also at level three to have more the general terms and to see if we can uh, broadly um, subject index the documents. Um, because we had very limited data, we did a ten tenfold cross-validation to get a bit more uh, insight uh, and a bit more stable results, of course. Um, Unfortunately, it was really at the end of the project that we started to work with ANIF, so we only tried the, the simplest back and CF IDF. But Annika has plans to continue this research uh, with uh, more advanced uh, ANIF models. So that's really cool. Um, and we used the ANIF hyperparameter optimization to determine the hyperparameters of the limit. So uh, four terms for each document were uh, suggested. And the threshold, so uh, um, Osma earlier showed that every uh, possible subject gets a score. And we said the threshold only for subjects that have a score above 0.4 uh, are actually uh, reported. Um, and at first, we also uh, determined the majority baseline. And that is uh, on every level in the hierarchy, we just uh, say if we pick the most frequent term at that level, uh, what would you score in that case? So at the highest level, which is either police legislation or, in, or international law, um, the baseline is already very high because 95, more than 95% of the documents actually is about uh, police legislation. And that makes it really hard to beat that baseline. So in this case, you see that the model performs worse than the baseline, but at the deeper levels of the hierarchy, uh, the, the model starts to improve over the baseline. Um, so what you see in the uh, graph is the uh, majority baseline is in purple and the precision at one for both the test in red and the in the blue and the train set in red. Uh, so the precision at one means that you, uh, for the highest ranked subject that is uh, suggested, measure whether that's actually also assigned to the document manually. Um, and while train precision, you can see that it's much higher than the test precision. And that's mostly due because the, the amount of data was very limited. So you have a lack of generalization of the model. Um, and there's also a lot of variance, especially in the test positions. Um, that's the variance over those tenfold. So you can see that, uh, on average, it's the, the middle line, but there's there's a lot of variation in uh, score between the different folds of the data. Um, but of course, it is more interesting also to look at uh, how well it does on several terms, because we know that several terms are assigned to every document. Um, so we measured precision and recall at four, the, at, at uh, predicting all those four terms. Um, and then precision indicates whether the terms suggested by the model are actually also correct according to the manual annotation, uh, whereas recall measures to what extent the manually assigned terms were actually also suggested by the model. Um, and we display here the micro-average results because there's, there's different ways you can create an average from, from all the suggestions. Um, we chose the micro-average uh, data because it's more robust against imbalance data. If you have one class that's very frequent and another class that's uh, very infrequent, um, both of them have the same, uh, examples from both of them have the same impact. Um, and you have to know that at level four and five, uh, so at level four, 163, and at level five, 1584 categories were available. Um, and you see that the model is able uh, so that's the, at, at level five, the rightmost column, uh, the recall is already 40%. This 40% of the manually assigned terms were also suggested by the model. And I think given the amount, limited amount of data that it's a pretty impressive result. Uh, however, the precision is still quite low. So there's, there's room for improvement. 
um, but we believe that adding more data, as Annemiek is working on right now, um, will increase the performance. And it would be really interesting also to look at the different models to see how, how well they do, especially Omikuji, as it's uh, a backend that's also very uh, good at uh, imbalanced data. I think that would be uh, very useful uh, for this kind of data as well. Um, so yeah, that, that was something that we really ran into, that the, the amount of data was very limited. Um, uh, and there's also some things about specifically this data. So many uh, other uh, uh, scenarios in which you use ANIF, for instance, what uh, Osma showed with the BBC News, you have proper text and it's modern text. Um, but because we digitalized those uh, texts and had transcribers transcribe all the uh, text in them, um, there are always some errors that occur and that makes it harder for a model to recognize words. If there's one letter that is misspelled, it, it already doesn't know what word it, it is. Uh, so that has an impact and it will be interesting to measure that impact too. Um, and for now we use the Snowball Dutch Stammer, which is integrated into ANIF, it's from the NLTK package. Um, but it would also be really interesting to see if uh, the historical language has an impact on the performance because uh, in historical Dutch there is no strict spelling guideline, so there's a lot of variation even within a text, the same word could be spelled in different ways, uh, which makes it hard for a model to recognize that it's actually the same word so that it means the same thing. Um, and also, I think for this project, but also for ANIF in general, it would be really interesting to see uh, how, how the hierarchy in the categories can be used uh, to improve the uh, results. Um, I think many thesaurus have some kind of hierarchical system and it could be really useful to have a model that is, or a backend that's really aware of that hierarchy. Um, so I put a few pointers in here. Uh, the first is the publication about this project at the H. Benelux Journal. Um, we have some information on the KB lab website, also uh, some blogs and the data set of this project, if you're interested in them. Um, and at the bottom, I put a bullet with some other work we do at the KB with ANIF. And we also continue to work with ANIF in different settings uh, for subject indexing documents and to seeing how we can aid our cataloging department also using ANIF. Um, and as I said, Annemieke continues to work on the early modern legislation in her uh, project at the Huygens Institute. It's called Game of Thrones. And uh, I hope she'll be able to uh, do some more experiments with Anif on bigger data. She always also plans to uh, in, uh, include data from different countries uh, because there's also, I think, a lot of uh, data from Germany and Switzerland that has already been annotated with the same categories. So it would be really interesting to see um, how, how that performs uh, and maybe also look at the multilingual setting, how, how to deal with that. Um, and as I said, in the KB, we're still continuing to experiment uh, with ANIF um, in a tool. And I, I gave a talk on that uh, pretty recently. So if you're interested, you can also check it out. That was it. So. I'm curious to hear if there's any questions. Okay, um, thank you very much, um, Anamika and Sara. Um, we have a question. Uh, uh, okay, uh, at the start, uh, Anamika, at the start, you mentioned a research question. Uh, to what degree does automated subject indexing help with that in relation to topic modeling? Osma, could ANIF also do topic modeling? Well, for me, it's important to stick to the categorization that has already been created in Germany, because I would like to, in the long, uh, in the longer run, connect all the legislation from the low countries to the German legislation through linked data. And if I were to use topic modeling, then the computer would have a go and would spit out uh, various topics and the 
um, different, well, it would probably use different words than when I do topic modeling uh, on German sources, besides from just the language. So if I have a restricted uh, subject uh, categorization pool of words that it could uh, use, then uh, chances are that I would end up with words that are um, well, nearly similar or at least uh, similar uh, to apply. And with that, I hope to be able to make this connection through uh, various territories more easily. And uh, as we have shown, um, well, we do need more training data, but um, ANIF performs really well. And if we can then make the next step to link data, uh, it will be possible to see if um, my laws actually traveled uh, or at least the topic so if you have wandering soldiers moving from one area to another it would be uh, more easy to track whether um, they created legislation on these uh, troubles that the soldiers created just by looking at the topic of uh, soldiers or um, uh, plundering or whatever but because we restrict the topics that the computer could choose from it's easier to uh, to um, well to, to do this kind of uh, research rather than topic modeling and to, <clears throat> to the question of whether um, Anif can do topic modeling so mm, at the moment no and I'm basically uh, echoing what Annemika just said but uh, we started from a library context where the uh, controlled voc vocabularies are very important uh, especially for um, uh, semantic interoperability so you have many collections using the same same the vocabulary which makes them makes it possible to co combine them and do a combined search and so on so Topic modeling hasn't really been relevant for us. Uh, yeah. Maybe I should stress that legal texts have a very defined vocabulary so that there's little room for interpretation either. So that's uh, something that's very beneficial when trying these kind of tools out on legal text. We have another question. Uh, just uh, about a clarification of terminology. The presentation referred at uh, some time to classes. Uh, what does class mean in this context and what is the role of classes in, in subject indexing? I think when we write class we mean uh, the subject label. So in, in machine learning uh, uh, this problem is, is uh, is, is, is named classification because you have to apply a class to every document or several classes. Um, so you can just view class as, as a subject. Okay. So if there are no further questions, then um, if you all agree, I think we can move yeah. on to Osmos, yeah? Yeah, that's what I thought. Um, see, can you see, see my screen? My yes. Slide. Okay, so uh, I'll give a few examples of where uh, ANIF is already used in, in production. And uh, uh, so uh, first of all, the, the first, uh, the, let's say the early adopter of ANIF was uh, uh, the University of Uvascula and they have a, a, a repository called UX uh, for storing, uh, among other things, their, uh, the thesis of their students. And uh, uh, so for them, for their students, uh, once they complete their thesis, uh, they, they place it here in the repository and the students themselves are doing it. So they are basically uploading the, the thesis and filling in a, a form uh, with the metadata about the thesis. And uh, uh, before they uh, started using ANIF, uh, the students were basically given, an, uh, in, in the metadata form, they had an empty field for subject, just like type in your, the, the, the keywords or the subjects of, of your thesis here. And, um, and it was like, uh, the, the problem here was that basically everybody was doing this for the first time and most of the students were not familiar with the subject indexing and with the vocabulary they were using. So, so um, they had a lot of problems with this. And uh, so um, 
they, they started using UNIF instead. And here the uh, idea is that when the students upload their thesis, uh, the, the text of the thesis is um, uh, given to UNIF and then UNIF suggests some uh, possible uh, topics or subjects for the, for the text. And, and then the students get a list like this where they can then choose the, uh, what they think are the most appropriate topics. And um, for them, this was a relief because it, uh, it's, it's a much easier uh, task for the students to just select the appropriate uh, topics from the suggestions instead of coming up uh, you know, from, from scratch. Uh, they can, of course, also assign uh, subjects that uh, were not suggested by the algorithm. And, uh, um, but then there's also a librarian in the loop uh, who checks the subjects and the other metadata given by the students before it's published. So there, there's also a, a professional librarian uh, part of the process. And uh, a very similar um, process was implemented recently uh, by the University of Vasa and their uh, repository called Osuva. And um, it's just a technically a different implementation, but, but it's the same, same idea. Uh, and they started doing this in, in the spring. Uh, then um, another uh, case of, of using UNIF in production is a company called Kirja Valitus. Um, it's a very, um, uh, it has a very central role in the, let's say the book ecosystem in Finland, because it, it's a company that does, handles the logistics uh, of uh, between uh, publishers and booksellers. And it also handles the metadata part of that logistics. So it um, uh, collects information about new books being published and, and uh, then uh, uh, passes this information on to, to uh, everyone who needs it. And uh, what they have started doing is that when they get information about new titles from publishers, they send, uh, uh, they give the text, uh, the description of, of, of the book to, uh, uh, to UNIF, uh, in practice, the Finto AI service, which I will talk about briefly in, in a moment. Um, they give this to UNIF and then UNIF provides uh, suggestions for subjects. And, and then uh, there's a person uh, in the company who uh, performs correction and curation again. and and then uh, finally, the metadata is distributed to uh, book sh bookshops and online stores and also to libraries, for example, the Melinda Union Catalog, uh, uh, which is uh, a large, uh, the main catalog of, uh, main bibliographic catalog in Finland and uh, includes also the Fennica uh, National Bibliography and also directly to some public libraries. So in this case, they have been able to uh, provide a more, uh, more detailed, uh, more specific metadata uh, about upcoming titles than, than before. So previously the cataloging was only done when the title was, when the book was actually published, but, but now they have started uh, doing the initial uh, subject, uh, subject uh, cataloging uh, earlier when they only have the preliminary, preliminary information about the book. Uh, then um, uh, at the National Library, we uh, recently, in May, we launched the, the Finto AI service. Um, it's like a sister, uh, sister service to, to, to Finto, the, the thesaurus and ontology service. Um, and this is basically, uh, um, uh, this is um, a service uh, built around uh, UNIF. And uh, it has the same, uh, same basic user interface, just slightly different uh, layout or uh, design. Uh, but um, so it, it works either as a web form uh, or as an API service uh, in, in three languages, Finnish, Swedish, and English. So you can give it text and it will suggest subjects. And, uh, and uh, with this, uh, we, uh, after developing UNIF for about three years, uh, we, uh, made it into a, a production system. So we are, uh, of course, continuing the development of UNIF uh, as a general purpose tool, uh, but this is a sort of more specific service to, especially to Finnish libraries that we provide. And then I will talk a little bit about evaluation and Cora um, uh, uh, gave an excellent uh, uh, introduction into how, how this should be done 
and, and uh, many ideas. Uh, I'm afraid we don't quite live up to those ideas because in, in many cases the evaluation is just part of the uh, uh, many development tasks we are doing and uh, we cannot invest all our resources only in that, uh, but we are still doing quite a bit of it. And, uh, and first of all, I'm, I'm reflecting on the approaches that Cora presented and uh, uh, there were three kinds of approaches and the first was uh, to evaluate directly through assessment by a, uh, an evaluator or by comparison with a gold standard and the second one was to evaluate uh, in the context of an indexing workflow. And then the third one was retrieval performance. Well, we've done some of the first and the second, not so much of the third one. And so first of all, assessment by evaluators. So um, here, I guess the main uh, thing we've done is that we organized a workshop uh, about, uh, well, end of last year. And uh, as you can see in the picture, we had about 50 people in the room uh, and they were given uh, 50 example documents um, uh, as printouts mostly, or in some cases physical uh, books. And, and then they were given uh, um, candidate subjects for those documents. And, and these uh, candidate subjects were collected either from uh, human indexers who had been uh, assigned, had assigned these subjects or uh, for different algorithms. And uh, and after doing this exercise, which, which took about two hours, uh, we were able to, uh, the, 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 yeah, so, so the, the tasks given to these evaluators was to rate the suggested subjects and, and to mark the ones that were, were uh, inappropriate. And, and they were rated them on, on three different measures, uh, on uh, coverage, uh, and then the uh, specificity, and then uh, general quality. And uh, I'm sorry, the diagrams aren't finished, but um, I'll try to explain here. So uh, here, the <clears throat> the red bar is the best performing ensemble algorithm, and the uh, bluish bars are all uh, variations of human indexing, slightly different uh, from slightly different uh, uh, sources. And uh, in all three uh, quality measures, uh, the algorithm was. Uh, clearly weaker than the human assigned uh, subjects, but the difference wasn't uh, dramatic. I mean, the, there is a difference clearly, but um, but it's uh, it, yeah uh, almost competitive, I would say. And and then um, in in terms of uh, the uh, inappropriate subjects. Uh, uh, but less than 10% of the subjects assigned by humans were rated as inappropriate, whereas it was more than 20% for the best performing algorithm. So clearly the algorithm uh, so, uh, often suggests uh, inappropriate subjects more often than, than humans. And there's also an article, unfortunately, that's also in Finnish. You can try Google Translate on it, uh, but we wrote an article about this workshop. And uh, uh, a similar exercise was conducted recently at the Finnish broadcasting company Ule, and uh, they wanted to co compare the quality of ANIF versus uh, or against the the uh, the Leiki uh, platform, which is a commercial service they are currently using uh, for their uh, for the subject indexing of their uh, news articles. So. Um, they chose uh, 100 articles in Finnish and 100 in Swedish uh, from different, uh, uh, from four different subject areas. Um, and, uh, and the subjects that had been assigned to those. And, uh, uh, and they, um, the evaluators were given this kind of form where they had to rate the uh, subjects without knowing uh, where the subjects came from, whether it was from Anif or Leiki, and and that they had to say whether it's essential, okay, non-relevant, or wrong for each of these subjects. And uh, in the results uh, for Finnish, uh, Anif was given slightly higher scores than Leiki. Uh, so there were more of the essential and okay uh, uh, ratings and, and less of the non-relevant and wrong. Uh, but the difference was not very big. 
but for Swedish, uh, interestingly, the result was actually uh, very different, uh, and uh, the Anif uh, was performed much better than Lakey in all the subject areas, and uh, uh, especially in business and science, the difference was uh, very large. Uh, there have been some speculations about the reasons for this, but one uh, possible explanation is that traditionally the uh, the Swedish language department of Ule has uh, uh, put a lot more uh, effort into their subject indexing, and since this uh, the models Anif models were trained on the uh, old indexed articles, it's possible that uh, that the the algorithm benefited from the better quality training data in in case of Swedish, whereas in Finnish the they have been using the Lakey algorithm for a long time, and uh, it's possible that uh, a lot of the metadata is just uh, uh, coming almost directly from the Lakey algorithm. Uh, so, it, it, Anif might just end up imitating Le uh, Lakey instead of, you know, basing it on, on good quality uh, metadata. Okay, so so that was the. Uh, um, uh, uh, um, evaluation of, of subjects. Then uh, we've also done some comparisons about uh, against the gold standard and here it's usual, it's uh, good to know the measures that are commonly used especially precision recall and, uh, and the combination F1 score. Well uh, <clears throat> Sarah already talked about precision and recall so I won't repeat that and the F1 score is just a way to combine the precision and recall into a single measure which is the harmonic mean of precision and recall. And um, so here I'm showing some uh, comparisons uh, against various uh, gold standards, and, but I put gold standard in quotes here because you could argue that it's not a very high quality gold standard. We, in most cases we have just relied on the existing uh, metadata from the catalogs and uh, sometimes it's better like for example in the case of uh, the uh, f uh, the, the Finnish national bibliography where the subject indexing is, is uh, uh, quite high quality, but in other cases it can be low quality metadata. Any, in any way, uh, here the bars are showing the F1 scores uh, of uh, the similarity between what ANIF suggests uh, and the gold standard for various uh, uh, data sets. Here are six different set data sets in Finnish and uh, three in Swedish and three in English. And, uh, and <clears throat> each uh, color of a bar is, uh, is one particular version or uh, setup of ANIF. And so the, the gray one is the first prototype and then the blue one is the, the, the next one and so on. And the most recent one is, is the, the purple one. And um, you should see here the pattern that in, in almost all cases, we have uh, been able to uh, significantly inter uh, improve the, the quality of the uh, algorithm suggestions over time. So the most recent model is much better than the, the previous versions we've had. And all, um, except for the first one, all of these uh, newer models are uh, basically ensembles consisting of, of several algorithms working together. So, so um, it, this has been an important way for us to improve the, the quality, to, to, to train many models and combine them into ensembles. Then uh, also <clears throat> uh, briefly about evaluating in the context of an indexing workflow. So uh, what we have been able to do is to, to collaborate with the University of Uvascula, who have been using ANIF in the UX repository, as I told you, and uh, so they provided us with some data about uh, how often the students uh, uh, selected uh, the, the, the subjects suggested by ANIF. And, uh, and uh, the data covers two different periods. Uh, the first period is uh, the original prototype of ANIF. And, and then the second period is, is a newer version uh, in 2018. And uh, the bars here show the similarity uh, of, of, of the suggestion by ANIF and the, the selections uh, uh, either by the students, which is the blue bar, or the, the final 
uh, uh, subjects which were uh, uh, verified by a librarian. Um, uh, so what's uh, apparent here is that uh, the prototype did not perform so well. So only a third of the suggestions were uh, accepted by the students. Uh, but the new version uh, the next year uh, which is already two years ago, and an old model uh, by now, uh, uh, about half of the suggestions were uh, acceptable. So, um, so clearly there has been an improvement and uh, we haven't uh, collected the, we, we, the, the similar data for later times, but it would be possible to do a comparison also to the more recent models. And some of the lessons from, from the evaluations we have done. So um, echoing what, what Cora said, uh, I think the different evaluation approaches are, are complementary. So it's not a good idea to, to look at just a single measure, for example, uh, similarity between, uh, against the gold standard, because that might be misleading. So it's good to, to use multiple approaches in parallel when it's, when it's feasible. Uh, but of course, uh, many of these evaluations are quite uh, labor intensive. You need, uh, for example, a room for, full of people for two hours or uh, something similar uh, and virtually, um, like Ule did. And uh, so you can't, I mean, you can't spend all your time on this. Uh, uh, and it, it clearly the quality of um, automated subject indexing we're doing has improved over time. And part of it is that we have, uh, over time, we've um, um, got access to better training and evaluation data, but also, of course, better algorithms. And es especially Omikuji has been very, uh, uh, very good for us. And, and the, another improvement was the neural network ensemble, which is a more advanced uh, ensemble method uh, that can um, sort of better identify when a particular uh, algorithm is trustworthy and when it isn't. Mm, but it's um, evaluation, it's a continuous process, it will never stop and we will keep doing it and just to, to make sure we are making progress. Uh, then I want to say something uh, about um, a hands-on tutorial we have uh, prepared, which is a, a sort of a continuation of, of uh, today's, um, today's session. So if you are interested in uh, learning to use only for yourself on your own data, uh, then I warmly recommend that you uh, take a look at this. Uh, so this is um, a tutorial we prepared uh, together with uh, the Leibniz uh, the Information Center for Economics, ZBW, which is a German library for economics literature. And so we put together uh, uh, materials um, that are freely available for anyone who's interested. And uh, <clears throat> So uh, you could say that the tutorial um, consists of three parts. The first part is understanding what UNMIF is. And uh, since you're listening to this presentation, this basically covers, covers this part. So you should already uh, have a general understanding what UNMIF is. And the second part is the hands-on tutorial, uh, which consists of videos and uh, exercises, written exercises. And um, this is something that is designed uh, to be done on your own time, on your own schedule. Um, and, uh, <clears throat> and you should be able to um, follow the instructions to install UNIF and, and to, to uh, uh, complete the exercises. And there are also some example data sets, so you don't have to uh, have your own data available yet to be able to do this. And, and finally, uh, if, um, if you want to get some, or if you need more support or want to discuss what you've learned, uh, uh, we arrange also some online sessions um, uh, where you can ask questions, get help, discuss what you've learned and so on. Um, I will um, tell more shortly. Uh, so um, there's currently a set of 14 videos, which are, uh, available on YouTube uh, and uh, you're not expected to watch all of them. Some of them are, you, you can take different paths through this material depending, for example, on what kind of installation you have of UNIF. So, uh, but yeah, so there's plenty of these available. They are all, they are all um, less than 10 minutes each, so short videos. 
And then there are these exercises, and these are divided into core and optional exercises. The blue ones here are the core ones. So uh, you should complete at least the core ones to get a sort of a good general understanding of what ONIF can do. And then the optional ones are if you want to uh, learn more about a particular topic. All of the material is uh, in the ONIF tutorial repository on GitHub. And, uh, uh, you can go there to, to find it. Um, and then uh, about the online sessions, uh, we have scheduled uh, two sessions for October. The first one is on Friday, the 9th October, the same time as this session was, so uh, early morning European time. And, uh, and then another one is on the Wednesday, 21st of October, uh, which is um, uh, later in the day and in the afternoon in Europe late afternoon, early evening. And uh, in both cases, the registration starts uh, two weeks before. But uh, if you want uh, to register, you should, um, you should already have watched the videos and tried to complete the exercises, or at least are planning to do so before the session, because um, the idea is that you try to go, get as far as you can with the materials we have. And, and then if you get stuck, we can help you during these sessions. And there's more uh, information and uh, the registration links will be put also in the UNIF tutorial GitHub repository. Uh, finally, I wanted to mention that uh, we have uh, started um, an, uh, an um, interest group on automated subject indexing uh, at DCMI and uh, uh, the, the group has a, a well a web page which is here and a, and a mailing list that you can subscribe to, and uh, we have also scheduled our uh, an online meetup for the sixth of November uh, in the morning European time, and if you want to, you can join the session and uh, we want to keep it as an informal we meetup where everybody has. Uh, maybe five minutes to uh, introduce themselves and, and uh, uh, tell what, the, what their relation is to automated subject indexing, what they would like to do. And, and, and this is a chance to, to, um, um, to network, to meet people and to uh, get help with your projects on automated subject indexing. And this is more general than just ANIF. So any, any discussion relevant to automated subject indexing, for example, on evaluation practices or commercial tools or um, services is, is also uh, relevant here. But that's it. Thank you from my side. And here's also a picture of, of my team. Uh, Juho and Mona are also working on ANIF and uh, the tutorial materials together with me at the National Library. And at the bottom, there's the link to the slides as well, if you want to check out something. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Osma. Um, we could end it here uh, because we're almost at, um, uh, at the uh, end of our uh, time slot, uh, or we could potentially um, take uh, one or two questions if, um, if there's interest. Uh, there's one question. Um, Anif uses five or six algorithms such as uh, MAUI or uh, TF-IDF. Um, are many algorithms such as these being developed, perhaps as based on different approaches? And to what extent are they available as open source as opposed to closed source or commercially licensed? Okay, so maybe I can answer this. Um, um, yes, we have some new algorithms in the pipeline. And uh, for example, uh, recently there, is, uh, uh, there was a pull request from the ZBW, the German Economics Library, who have implemented their own uh, lexical algorithm, uh, uh, which is especially uh, uh, meant for short texts, such as when you have just a document title or a short abstract. And uh, so this is um, in the process of being integra integrated to ANIF. Uh, also, we have a collaboration with um, the CSC, uh, which is a um, uh, center for IT. Um, uh, they are basically helping uh, Finnish universities with, uh, with uh, 
running supercomputers and stuff like this. And they are testing algorithms uh, um, for us, potential new candidates to be integ integrated. And they were the ones who found Omikuji as well. And right now they are testing some algorithms based on, uh, on, on uh, uh, neural networks, uh, um, heavy, heavy algorithms, for example, using uh, the BERT uh, uh, model, uh, language models. And um, it's, it's possible that eventually this will also lead to new algorithms being integrated with ANIF. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and um, uh, all, the, all the ones that I'm aware of are open source. So uh, I haven't seen any, any commercial uh, systems in, in, uh, in this. I mean, there are commercial systems, but they are, as far as I know, not being integrated with ANIF. Mm. Okay, we have another question. Um, Osma, have you explored the quality of Finto vocabularies for lexical indexing? Uh, for example, good hierarchies for disambiguation, plenty of synonyms and, and the such. Uh, would vocabulary owners be interested in improving them this way? Uh, I think this would also improve information retrieval. Uh, yes, you're, yeah, that's, that's, that's right. Um, the, um, um, we haven't done any formal evaluation, but this is one of the sort of, uh, uh, this is on the back of our minds when, when, when these vocabularies are being uh, maintained and, and developed. So for example, we try to add synonyms, uh, uh, of course, also to the benefit of human indexers, but also algorithms. Um, and, uh, I think this is getting more uh, more relevant now that we are sort of rolling out the, uh, the services for automated indexing, especially Finto AI. So, so yeah, I think that, that there should be an interest in this area, but it's just you know it's just starting. Okay, so if there are no further questions, um, I want to thank Osma, Cora, Anamika, and Sara uh, for the great presentations. And uh, thank you all um, uh, for attending this, uh, this session. Uh, the recording will be available um, for the duration of the, um, of the conference and it will be made available um, Osma, do you want to comment on that? The recording will be made available um, pretty soon after the um, end of the conference. Yes, we are trying to make it available uh, by the end of this week, uh, at least on the National Library of Finland YouTube channel. But I think DCMI will also publish it uh, yeah. on their YouTube channel uh, after the conference. So That's right. It might, might get, end up being published twice, but no. yeah. <laughs> Okay. Thank you, for, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks.